earlier than we normally do because we are going to introduce our students and their families um, tonight. And we're going to listen to each of them give a two-minute speech. And so, uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got some looks, but they didn't, they didn't. Oh, one of them's leaving. <laughs> now we're going to introduce uh, them and their families, and we look forward to that. And then we're going to do something even better than that. Eat desserts. There you go. There you go. So look forward to this tonight. This is, uh, um, I think, something that's really special uh, each year that this is done. Uh, let's us get to know the students who are here and lets the students get to uh, see the congregation here. And we want this to be a good relationship uh, for the two years that you're here. And we want the students to know that we love them, we have their back, we pray for them all the time. And uh, I think this is a good thing. We're going to be in Titus tonight, the book of Titus. And since we do have so many visitors, uh, let me again explain what we're doing. Uh, as a congregation... We are reading five chapters of the New Testament each day, the same five chapters each day for a week. And then on Thursdays, we start the next five chapters, and then so on and so forth. And so by the time that this year is over, uh, we'll have completed reading the New Testament at least five times, and some are reading it every day, so then it would be seven times in one year. So that's, that's our goal. And so we're trying to cover five chapters in one Bible class, which is impossible. And so we're just really kind of hitting some of the highlights. Uh, in times past, I've hit some, maybe some of the more difficult passages and, and talked about that. Uh, but tonight we're going to be in the book of Titus. And we're going to try just to hit the highlights of these three chapters. And I like these short books because this really lends itself to what we're trying to do. Uh, we're supposed to be talking Titus 1 through 3 and then Philemon and then Hebrews 1, but that's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, let's start with a word of prayer tonight. Our holy and righteous Father in heaven, you are from everlasting to everlasting. You are our God. We honor you, we trust in you, and we beg for your help each day. Father, for those times that we've sinned against thee, we're so sorry, and we pray that we'll be forgiven. Father, we're so thankful for so many things thankful for one another, uh, we're thankful for our families, uh, we're thankful, dear God, for this country in which we live, but most of all, we're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who really gives us hope, who gives us this common bond that we have. We're so thankful, God, for your word that lets us know how to get from here to where you are so that we can live for eternity with thee. Father, give us strength each day as we strive to live for thee. Help us to do just that. We're mindful, Father, for those who are sick. We're especially mindful for our brother Jim Woody. We're mindful, Father, for Cindy Owen's father. Uh, we're thankful, dear God, for the children that have been born, not only to uh, some of the students here, but our members, and also, dear God, uh, for the grandchildren that have been born to some of the wonderful grandparents that we have here. We pray that you'll bless their families. We love you. We look forward to the study tonight. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we are in Titus chapter 1. Let me just give you a little bit of background. We've, you know, been talking a lot about Paul, so I'm not going to talk more much about him, except that he is uh, the author of this great little letter. Um, but from the book of Acts chapter 14, we read about uh, the creation of different churches, different congregations, the establishment of these congregations as they went on the first, second, and third missionary journeys. And then some of that, they were establishing new congregations. Other times, they were going back to reestablish them, strengthen them. And uh, there's a congregation, and it, it's, it bears it out in the, in the book of Titus. This particular congregation that Titus is involved with would be a challenge for any preacher, uh, but especially a young preacher like Titus was. Uh, on the island of Crete, we're going to see kind of the reputation that these people had. And again, it's talked about and discussed in, in chapter 1 of this, of this great book. Uh, so this is a young preacher having to deal with some of these things. And so 
uh, as I said, you know, they strengthened the congregation, they exhorted them, uh, and they also exhorted them point elders in every city. You know, one of the first things they wanted them to be able to do, get some leadership in there. You're going to need leadership uh, so that these young congregations are going to have the help and the leadership that they need to deal with. And that's what one of the things Paul tells Titus to do uh, in this book. Uh, let's look a little bit about uh, Titus. He, according to chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Paul, a bondservant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. And then verse 4, to Titus, a true son in our common faith. And then it goes on. Uh, a true son in the common faith. This would probably mean that he was a convert of Paul. Paul taught him. Who else was a son of Paul? Timothy was. Timothy was. Timothy was a son in the faith. Um, do you ever read about Timothy in the book of Acts? We did, didn't we? Where, where was Timothy? Where did he come in contact with Paul? You remember what city? Lystra. Lystra. was in Lystra. And uh, we talked to you. That's where Paul was dragged out of the city, stoned and left for dead. But there's no mention of Titus in the book of Acts. Well, that doesn't mean we don't know something about him because we do. Uh, some of the things that we learn about Titus are found in the epistles. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. We can spend a little bit more time in this because the points I want to make about this, um, this book will be pretty simple to make. Things I want to leave with you tonight. Galatians chapter 2, verse 3. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. So, uh, he hasn't been circumcised. He was a Greek, which makes him not a Jew, but a what? A Gentile. Okay? Uh, he accompanied Paul to Jerusalem during the controversy over circumcision. Look at Acts, well, don't have to read there, just Acts chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. And then Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Again, um, that's what this is talking about. He wasn't compelled uh, to be circumcised. Uh, but it was during Paul's third journey that Titus became his uh, personal emissary to the church at Corinth. He was in charge of taking letters to the Corinthians. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. When Paul was seeking to learn how the Corinthians received his first letter, which I can imagine if I had written a letter like that, even though inspired, I would still be waited with bated breath. How are they going to take what I just wrote? Because some of it was very straightforward. Some of it, you know, could have come across as a little bit uh, harsh. How are they going to take this? Well, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verses 12 and 13. It says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to pe preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. And so he was seeking to learn how they received his first letter, but when Titus didn't return to Troas as expected, Paul went on to Macedonia. But now look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. This is when Paul and Titus finally connected. You ever thought of what it would be like uh, to be a missionary during this time? Uh, <laughs> this, you know, I think about people uh, like J.C. Bailey, and he was a Canadian missionary to India. Uh, he drove a Jeep all around, had malaria I don't know how many times. Uh, they didn't have air conditioning at that time in India. Uh, I've never had malaria so far. Um, 
I insist on a room with air conditioning. <laughs> I don't care if the bed's clean, if the shower's clean, if there's running water, give me air conditioning and I can, I can survive. Um, and I don't drive in India. J.C. Bailey, he was 90 years old and still driving around from village to village over there. So I think about those guys on the communication and how long it would take to send a letter. Uh, when I first started doing mission work, well, when we w went to Russia, there wasn't any such thing as email, but I had my wife with me, so I didn't need it. Uh, but when I started going to Africa without her and making these trips, the first thing I wanted to do is we got to find an internet cafe. You guys ever heard of an internet cafe? Now you have, okay. Uh, in, in Tanzania, you had to go to a certain place that had several computers there, and they had the internet. And first thing we want to do, we all got to find an internet cafe so we can tell our wives we made it and see if they've emailed us anything. Well, here, Paul and Titus, you know, he waits for him, waits for him, waits for him. He doesn't come. Well, I got to go on and keep working. Well, they finally reconnect. Uh, this is what I want us to see. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and, and watch what Paul learns here, verses 5 through 7. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Then verse 7, and not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he, comforted, he was comforted in you, when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. What kind of news did Titus give Paul about that first letter and their feelings toward Paul? They love you. They long for you. They received your letter well. Uh, they mourned at some of the things that had to be written about them. They made some necessary changes. Now, as we know, by the need for 2 Corinthians, that everything still wasn't perfect, but Paul was refreshed by this. Look, drop down to verses 13 through 15. Therefore, we have been comforted in your comfort, and we rejoiced exceedingly more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. You know, the best way that you can make me happy, you can say, well, I can do something for you, and that would make me happy. But you know what would make me even happier? You do something for my family. And that means even more. You know what I mean? You understand that, don't you? You, you? you do something for me, it makes me feel good and I appreciate it. You do something for my children or my wife, and that's even more. Why was Paul so happy? Well, look how they treated Titus and how refreshed he was uh, because of them. Look at verse 14. For in anything I have boasted to him about you, I am not ashamed, but as we spoke all things to you in truth, even so our boasting to Titus was found true. I'm bragging on you people, and you proved me right. You proved me right. Verse 15. And his affections are greater for you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. Isn't that beautiful? It really is, isn't it? Uh, do you ever boast in the right way I'm talking about, about the Forest Hill congregation. And I'm not talking about prideful boasting. But have you ever said something to somebody, listen, you need to come to visit us at Forest Hill. You, you will love it. I promise you'll love it. You will, you will be made to feel like you're welcome. Uh, people will, will really genuinely care about you. You just need to come and visit us at Forest Hill. And so you see that person walk through the back door and what's your hope when that person walks through the back door? Man, I hope Forest Hill doesn't let me down. <laughs> I, I hope that they, that they prove what I've been bragging about. And then after, you know, you're with your friend and you say, well, what did you think? What did you think? Oh, man, Mark, you were so right. That place is so friendly. They're so kind. They're so loving. I felt very, very welcome. And it just, yeah, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it, but it's a sense of relief. Well, this is how Paul said, I've, I told Titus, uh, you're going to love them, they're going to love you, but then when you finally see it happening, it just, it just means something. It's, it's sweet. It's very, very sweet. So then look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to get to Titus. We're just going to make three points from Titus. 
2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 16. You've been reading this all week, so you know Titus backwards and forwards, I'm sure. Chapter 8, look at verse 16. Paul sends Titus back, but thanks be to God who puts the same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. So not only was Paul glad the Corinthians treated him well, but what was Paul wanting from Titus? Look at it again. The same earnest care for you into the heart of Titus. Titus, I want you to go and, and you take care of these people. You take care of these people. You, you do what needs to be done for these people. And that's the job of a preacher, isn't it? What is needed, you do. What is needed, you do. And I think this is just a great illustration of that. For he not only accepted the exhortation, but being more diligent, he went to you of his own accord. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. And not only that, but who was also chosen by the churches to travel with us with this gift, which is administered by us to the glory of the Lord himself and to show your ready mind. Avoiding this, that anyone should blame us in the slavish gift which is administered by us, providing honorable things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with him our brother whom we have proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent because of the great confidence which we have in you. If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and our fellow worker concerning you, or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Therefore show them and before show to them and before the churches the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. That bragging has gone both ways, hasn't it? Continued to prove it. Yeah, well, yeah, that's what we're going to see. Now concerning the, the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians. Um, drop down to verse 3. Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this respect, that as I said, you may be ready. Lest if some Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to mention you, to be ashamed of this confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you have previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Boy, Paul's good, isn't he? Now, you promised to do this. Well, I wanted to give you a heads up for coming to collect it. And uh, you know, I know you'll do it because you said you were going to do it. But who does he trust to do this? Who's the one that is mentioned? Titus. Titus. Do you think Paul trusted Titus? He absolutely did. Um, but now, getting to Titus... At the time of Paul's epistle to Titus, he's been given another job. For this reason, verse 5, I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. What do we know about Crete? What do we know about the people? You guys taking Bible geography, I don't know if you talked about that much in there. Does anybody know what the Cretans were known for? <laughs> June says lying, and that's right. And, and you said just being Cretans. That's it. Uh, that's exactly right. You know, there was euphemisms for um, different areas, like to Corinthianize meant that you've really become debase. Um, and to Cretanize was you're just full of lies, you can't be trusted, you're, you're no good, you never will be any good. And this is where this young preacher has to go. And not just that, but has to help establish a leadership in this area. How would you like that job? This is what he goes and do. Now, if Paul's plans uh, that he expressed in this materialized, look at Titus chapter 3, verse 12. Here we go. When I send Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Um, if things go well here, this is, this is what our, our, our hope and where we're going with this. There's three things that I want to show us tonight from the book of Titus. And I think this is a great thing for all of us 
you know, when you, what little I understand about the Bible, when we understand new things, you, you just see the wisdom of God uh, in these short little letters that just make you know this is inspired. He gives us what we need. What's, what's promised when it comes to the Scripture? All Scripture is given for what purpose? But it's by inspiration of God, powerful for doctrine, recruitment, all of those things, that the man of God may be what? Complete. Right. Thoroughly furnished for every good work. Did you notice when you were reading the book of Titus, in chapter 1, the church is discussed. What was Titus supposed to do? If you're going to outline this three points, and this is not original with me, I can't remember where I got it, but I've written it in my Bible, uh, which it has to be pretty good for me to write it in my Bible. That's right, the church. This is what you do. You ordain elders. You establish elders in, in every city. Um, and then, of course, the qualification of the elders. Um, and here's why. Look at verse 10. You know, we think of elders... Sometimes we've, not we, but oftentimes in the church we forget, you know, we look at our elders, okay, well they're the ones that tells us when we're going to have potlucks, they're the ones that tell us, you know, what time we're going to meet, um, and that's, that's the job of, of an elder. And then the preacher's supposed to do the visiting, the preacher's supposed to preach against those people who are doing wrong. If anybody's causing a problem, the preacher is, is to, but watch the purpose of this. Verse 10, for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcisions. What do they have to do? Why do we need elders whose mouths must be stopped? Does that sound like, well, you know, you're not really um, saying the best things, maybe doing the best things, but it's okay. We love you anyway. Just keep right on going, saying and doing the things you're... you're... No. Stop their mouths. Drop down to verse 13. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. You rebuke them sharply for what purpose? To keep them sound in the faith. You're not rebuking them sharply just to put them in their place. Although that feels good sometimes. <laughs> but that's when you know you're doing it for the wrong reason. Even try to edify as you rebuke them sharply to keep them in the faith. And so you can read the rest of that uh, Look at verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but even their mind and conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. You need leadership to take care of these things. Point number two in chapter two. So chapter one is the church, dealing with the church. Chapter two is dealing with our families. Watch it. But as for you, verse 1, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Okay, now what do you think of when I think when I say the word doctrine? Teaching? Yeah, that's a preacher student response. <laughs> if I said, all right, I'm going to preach about, I'm going to preach some doctrine this next Sunday, what would you expect me to preach about? Don't tell me what you think I want to hear. Tell me what you would honestly think. If I said, I'm going to preach, I'm going to preach some hard doctrine next Sunday. Fundamentals, maybe the one true church, or I'm going to preach about baptism and, and um, you know, the, the need for, for understanding the one true church. But watch what he calls doctrine here, sound doctrine. The older men may be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in the faith, and love in patience. He's talking to the older men. You need to be sound in the faith. The older women, likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So gossiping, slandering, that's doctrine. That's hard doctrine, you might say. Uh, they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet. So chapter 2 is instructions for the home. Chapter 1, instructions for the church. Chapter 2, instructions for the home. Chapter 3, Instructions on how to get along with our community. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. You see the three things? What do I need? I need to know how to be active in the church. 
I need to know how to be good in my family environment. And I need to know what it is to be a good Christian citizen. There's one phrase and then we have to close. To speak evil of no one. Do you think that's symbolism or do you think that that means what it says? June says she thinks it means what it says. What about the rest of us? No, I think it would be good for us to really think about that. Again, not just us, but maybe even us. Especially around election season. <laughs> Especially around pandemic time. And hopefully it's not a season. Hopefully it's one and done. To speak evil of no one. Not easy, is it? Uh, but what a challenge. That's doctrine, too, by the way. All right. We're out of time. Look forward to meeting these students.